there I'm just shooting a quick video of um, myself at the moment just as an, an interim video because uh, you might be wondering where my game of um, Wellington's victory is well the answer is if you look at this surface here it is underneath you can just see some counters there because um, <clears throat> we had guests my parents came to visit so this room was converted into a bedroom and I wanted to protect it because uh, I was only halfway through so I, I, I uh, covered it with a board and, and stuff like that so I, and then the thing is this I've got a week now and uh, and then we're going to Long Island for two weeks to visit some relatives there so I don't think it's worth unearthing that just to um, leave it gathering dust for another two weeks so um, but just in case one or two people were wondering where things has got to with that I thought I'd just do this interim video and so this is what I'm going to um, do a quick overview of today it's a little gem of a game I'll qualify that at, at the end called Orbit War now um, it's designed by a chap called Wallace Wang I know nothing more about him and it's developed by Steve Jackson and originally it was um, the issue game in an issue of the Space Gamer. So you, you've got some fantasy game stuff here and so forth. So um, I uh, I don't still have, I might have the Space Gamer in an attic somewhere, but um, uh, I just took the game out and uh, and here it is. So um, I mounted it many years ago on a on a piece of hardboard. So this was the central portion of. Of um, the rules, and you can see it's split. On the other side, I've actually got a game called Zoot, which was also a magazine game. I seem to remember. I'm not sure where the rules and pieces are for that. I might get to that one day. But anyway, I had had this for a while, and I hadn't really tried it, um, at least not for many, many years. And uh, I thought I'd give it a quick go because it's um, advertises a playing time of about half an hour. Now, um, I've got all the pieces set up here. Because it's a magazine game, you have to um, mount... These were originally just on the paper. It's 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 glossy paper, um, so the counters have that nice glossy sort of feel to them. And um, I mounted them sacrilegiously on the back of... Uh, the pieces from... Where are we? That North Africa quad game. That was the first ever war game I bought, probably when I was about 16 or something like that. And as as then as, as now, many of my game buys were based on whether it was a bargain or not, not necessarily on what the game was. You know, if I was vaguely interested, and I was at that time, especially I was just interested in practically everything. The same now, really. <laughs> so I bought North Africa because it's a quad. Um, so you get... You get four games in it, and uh, uh, my, me and my younger brother, we used to play with our toy soldiers. We, you know, we invented rule sets. We read a few rule sets. Got Donald Weatherstone's book at some point, I imagine. I seem to remember. Um, and we had fun. He always used to claim that I cheated and made up the rules as I went along. <laughs> but at that time, that was his fault for not having an interest in the rules design. <laughs> But anyway, and, and then we got into role-playing games, car wars and all that kind of thing. So, but And I got this, my first ever proper war game by, you know, historical war game, rather than something like Raid on Iran. Well, mind you, that was a historical war game by Steve Jackson's, but that's another story. Um, and anyway, so I got this, and uh, I looked at the pieces, looked at the maps, maps cool, looked at the pieces. Mm. Bunches and bunches of... Same coloured dryness. I looked at the rules and I read through it and I oh. And it all just seemed terribly dry for me. So it didn't take me long to desecrate the maps with felt tip and make my own maps. Look, I filled the desert <laughs> with bits of jungle and swamps. And then here, this was the start of it all. I, I built my own ogre map. Um, put it with lava pits and so forth on one side of the Crusader map 
And so um, that was the end of, of those. Having said that, what I'm going to do is I am going to play them now because in my mature years, I am more interested in the system. From like a historical perspective, um, one of these is designed by David Isby. So each each one has its separate designer. Um, but at the time, you can see what I did. I, I pasted other counters basically from magazine games. This was an interesting game called Mind Meld. I'd quite like to do a quick video of that, just a very short game. Um, there was my original Ogre. You can see the counters were very thin, just a thin cardboard. It was cut out. Um, these, I, I drew my own counters for Starfire on the back because I found the rules somewhere, but not counters. I think maybe I photocopied a friend's copy or something. But anyway, so the upshot is is that these there's lots of counters for this game. And you need to make them yourself. If you cannot find a copy of the Space Gamer, don't worry, because you can buy this game from Warehouse, the website Warehouse 23, which is a branch of the Steve Jackson games um, stuff. And I think originally it was just um, set up to provide PDF downloads of old Space Game games and stuff like that, stuff from um, Steve Jackson's um, house. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, his... Uh, company house as it were um, but now it's got all sorts of um, other games designers it's got Amarillo games so lots of Starfleet battle stuff but and, and lots of other stuff there so it's worth a look at but the point is is that I think that it's worth reviewing this because and it, as a magazine it was just paper and you had to mount your own units you can get it as a pdf today for I think it's ten dollars maybe less and you have to do the same you have to mount your own units you're in the same situation so it's neither better nor worse and then, um, and you can see straight away you do actually get a lot of units. Why is that? Well, in in tune with a lot of war games from this period, I can't remember the exact date, and maybe I'll find it a bit later. Um, the this there are two phases to this game. It's quite a quick, simple game, but the first phase is building your units. So every unit has a point cost. And here in this game, interestingly enough, because we're looking at outer space, you have a point cost if you build it in orbit, in deep space, or on the Earth. So anyway, I'll get back to that in a minute. So the point is, is that y y you build your own units. The first phase of the game is building your forces. Now, because a lot of games of this era um, were um, small fantasy science fiction games you weren't so worried about a historical order of battle and so this build thing was a big feature of them that because also being fantasy and science fiction your the designer could go wild in in, in giving different flavors of units and uh, so you had a lot of flavors to choose from and it meant there's there was a lot of flexibility in uh, in game play but it could also mean you know it was um you would design a awful um team to pit against your opponent's team but then they're, they're quite quick games and half half the fun you know so you could you might have lost the game um before you actually got to the map in the sense that your design was not a well thought out design maybe or maybe it was a risky design and so you know you you, you made a gamble and you lost at that point but anyway here's all the units and what do you get you get orbital weapons platforms and each side is exactly the same and you have um, certain numbers of each so for example um, you have OWPs, you have 10 orbital weapons platforms each 15 hunter killers etc certain ones um, are unlimited so hunter killers they do what they say and um, the standard notations you've got along the top attack strength defense strength and then movement so you can see hunter killers move at two orbital weapons platforms only move at one um, these are early warning reconnaissance units they have no attack small defense only move at one so normally you move at units use it move at, at one then you have the cgs that's some kind of like jamming so that gives you can uh cause missiles to fail and um, increase defense of other units within the one or two hexes i think you have a counter for earth and first thing you'll notice is it's red and blue what that means is that we are pitting the ussr against the usa 
and um, there's a bunch of scenarios, I think four, and essentially they, they build up to the point where you're, you're trying to launch either from Earth or from space um, nuclear warheads at the opposing um, side. And you can see you have like a, a shaded area. So um, within these lines is, is the launch capability of the USA. And also if you're going to hit it, you have to send a rocket in those lines and then vice versa on the um, USSR and then you can see that there's kind of like a neutral row of hexes in between them so you have an interesting dynamic there already as it's trying to send rockets around and that's the whole point is essentially um, while your rockets are going around your um, opponents can have an orbital weapons platform or a hunter killer which is moving around trying to shoot that rocket down so then you have to have some orbital weapons platforms and hunter killers to knock them down and so on and so forth the early warning reconnaissance ones are interesting because what they do is if you if you have a russian one here so that's within the um american cone you get a victory point every turn that that is there because you have some early warning reconnaissance and vice versa on the american side then you also have each side has Actually, I think the Americans have two shuttles. I think that the Russians have one. No, they've got two as well. There's also some space stations. There are advanced um, units or advanced rules. And you get um, special forces. So you actually get some space infantry. Two units of those. So that's duplicated for the Americans. Then you get Earth-launched rockets. Now, you note they have a movement rate of three. Orbit-launched rockets movement rate of three so your rockets are faster you cannot chase a rocket with a hunter killer or a shuttle but you can intercept and there's some there's an interesting way of doing that because of the fact that we're in orbit you have supplies so you can resupply from earth or even from a shuttle or one orbital weapons platform to another um you have mines do what they say uh, and then you have the nukes you have standard nukes if one of these nukes hits your enemy, you score four victory points. If a three MIRV, so that's three warhead nuke, hits your enemy, you score ten victory points. And then you go all the way up to seven MIRV nukes, which score, oh, I think, 20 victory points for hitting your enemy um, Earth cone. So, And that's duplicated on the other side. So that is the units. Then there's a, a few more in that some satellites... now. Um, if it's not a rocket, it's a satellite. So orbital weapons platforms, hunter killers, even though they can ha have propulsion systems, shuttles counted satellites, they can be made suicidal. So you can send them careering towards the Earth and exploding. Um, then we also have missiles. Now, they don't have their own counters. They basically have a range of two. And that's what you're going to use to fire from orbital weapons platforms to hit other hunter killers and rockets. Then you have uh, those, okay, we've done everything else. Okay, so that is the game. So um, what you do is you, you build your forces and you start with the, um, the first, well, as I did just now, is the first scenario is called blockade. And that's interesting. So one unit has 45 points, the other has 35. And um, the one with 45 is a blockading player. So... Um, Victory conditions are that the game ends after 12 turns or when you destroy another person. So essentially what you're simulating is that um, one person's already got some forces up and the other person's trying to get their forces into space through that. Now, when I played that, I just put gave the Americans um, six mines all around the Earth and the Russians had a really hard time um, because they're not allowed to set up in orbit. But... Um, so they either had to set up in on Earth or they were allowed a certain number of 10 points, I think, in deep space. Now you can see there's variable point differences. So it's cheaper to set up on Earth, but then you need um, an Earth launch rocket. They're only f half a point to get off Earth. So if you have an orbital weapons platform on Earth, it costs two, but then you need a half, um, two and a half to get it into space. If you put it up in orbit... On the board it's going to cost you four or you put it into deep space only two and a half points the same cost as launching it from earth but you have to designate one of these sides number one two three four five or six 
and it will come in on turn four or after but turn four at the earliest anywhere on that edge so at the beginning of the game you have to decide where it's going to come in so the russians they did actually bring in some units from orbit they blew away um uh, the mines and because they also had three orbital uh, early warning reconnaissance systems they were racking up victory points right from the beginning um and the uh, americans basically um, sent, they had some orbital weapons platforms around here to defend their mines, and and then they sent some hard to killers off after the orbital uh, after the early warning reconnaissance. It took them a while to get there, and in the end, the um, uh, the Russians actually won on points. Then you go to the next um, scenario, which is called intercept. Ah, yes. So then, once uh, the Americans have a um, a shuttle which has to get from off from deep space to the earth and uh, the other you, you get sort of variable amount of build points depending on your side to set up on earth or in orbit to try and stop that or assist that um, then the next scenario is a uh, tripwire so that's limited action with each side waiting for the optimum moment to attempt a preemptive strike so in those first two scenarios there are no nukes so you only get points you get victory points for um, destroying enemy units and for early warning reconnaissance now in tripwire you get points for nukes and you can see that for um, 10 and 20 victory points is a hell of a lot of victory points considering you get only get two victory points for taking out an orbit uh, a, a one for taking that orbital weapons platform or hunting hunter killer the standard sort of units and uh two and three for three for them and two for cjs like jammers um so but the point is is that the first player to hit the uh enemy earth side loses 10 points as well as getting the victory points for the hit so if it was a just a normal nuke they, they would have a net minus six victory points so you, you know there's a balance between who's going to be the first to strike and once that strike occurs there's only 10 more turns left in the game and then it's over and you count up victory points now i didn't finish that game because um that one really needs two players because uh the point is you can fight missiles themselves not rockets for carrying payloads but missiles just for shooting down rockets and or uh, satellites they cost half um a build point you're going to want some of them on earth and that was something I, I hadn't noticed in my first game you know i said i had mines all the way around well if russia had had missiles based on earth they could have just shot the mines from earth because missiles have a range of two hexes. As I said, you can also, um, orbital weapons platforms can have up to 10 missiles, or they could carry something like, uh, and they can shoot orbit launched rockets, and they could potentially, I think, have a have a nuke, but then less missiles. Um, but there's various sort of combinations like that, the same with the shuttles, and the same with rockets, uh, same with the supply counters. But anyway, um, so once you get the nukes in it, you're going to, because the nukes are very costly in terms of points, so a normal nuke costs one, three is four, and eight, and it's the same whether in deep space or whatever. Um, in build points, you don't want to waste them. So you're going to be sending a lot of rockets, whether orbit or earth launched, at the uh, enemy player's side. And he's going to be shooting them down with missiles that he's bought quite cheaply or maybe uh, hunter killers that are around here. And so you're going to be sending a lot of dummies. So you're going to be launching a lot of rockets with nothing in them. And so it's a bit of a bluffing and guessing game. And uh, it's difficult, to do, obviously, to do that. You can kind of play out a scenario um, up to a point as a solo player do it, doing that but I basically sort of thought early on okay I think one side has it but then there was enough turns left that the other side would have launched all theirs and if you have run out of missiles um, you just have to watch these nukes raining down without any defence 
upon you. You might be able to capture them with hunter killers. Now uh, that brings me to the last uh, sort of main point of the game is um which is very interesting is you can see you have these lines. These are orbit lines. Now this is what makes the game really interesting but also a bit of a brain burner. Um, you see here you have numbers. It goes from a third, a half, and then one, one, two, two, three, three, and then four for the last um, orbit there. What that means is at the beginning of every turn, first of all, you check to see if the Earth rotates. Every fourth turn, the Earth rotates. So that is interesting in itself when you think about it. You know, say you've got early warning reconnaissance satellites set up here and it rotates and suddenly, um, or, or say it was more there, you, previously you were in the cone, suddenly the Earth rotates, you're out of the cone. But don't worry, because also the second um, part of the movement phase, oh, the second part is you launch rockets. So first, if you're launching them from Earth, you put them in one of these holding boxes here. So the, the uh, and if you're launching them from orbital weapons platforms or shuttles, you put them on those so your opponent can see what's coming. Then the third part of the movement phase, uh, the, the player t that turn, uh, sorry, not player turn, but turn. So you have Earth, check for Earth movement, launch, but hold in the hex, and then everything else moves in its orbit. So those in far orbit only move once every three turns. And you have a handy reminder here at the bottom of the turn track. These move once every two turns. Every turn, these two orbits move one. Every turn, these two orbits, you move two hexes. These orbits, you move three hexes. And this orbit, you move one, two, three, four. So you're whizzing around at a rate of knots. So you can see what happens if you have... Um, Russian orbital weapon platform here and a Russian orbital weapon platform here and an American one here at the beginning of the turn this one's going to move one this one's going to move two and this one's going to move three so at this point everybody was is within missile range at the end of last turn at the beginning of the next turn suddenly whoa. Okay, out of range, out of range. And it's going to get increasingly like that. This one's going to sling around and come back quickly. This one's going to be plodding around. He won't catch him up. This one will at a certain point. Um, and you only have a certain number of turns. It depends. This game can be 12 turns long or, like we said, with the tripwire scenario, it's tr the sort of end game triggers of 12 turns triggers at a certain point. And then the final... Um, game is a uh, scenario given is total war the beginning of world war three so um for the trip where you get 50 points each here you get 100 mil points each um and it suggests you have that trip wire special but anyway um that's getting details you don't need to know so this is what makes the game really interesting the orbit thing notice hunter killers have a um speed of two so if they're here and he orbits there he can always push himself back <laughs> so um but no um, and shuttles have a speed of two and rockets have a speed of three so rockets can pull themselves out what what you're going to find you want to do is pull straight out and then you're going to move a bit and then you'll pull out again and then you'll be sort of stabilized more or less you won't be spinning so fast then you have a nifty thing is that after the orbit movement you have optional movement interesting thing just is to note player a goes first on turn one turn one player b on turn goes second on turn two player b goes first and so it always alternates like that so you get these flip flops so every player gets a double turn every other turn which I think was deemed necessary to, for units to kind of try and catch up to sort of um, balance out this f flinging mechanism flinging around um, another thing to say is so in your um, say this fellow's here and he orbits here um, hunter killers do cannot 
fire missiles so that he's too far range but what he can do is you can always descend an orbit for free so you could the hunter killer could go down one into the lower orbit and then move two and now he's in the same hex so after the optional movement but no if the other players after him the other player will just move away one so there's there's a bit of judgment with that hunter killers can be quite tricky to um organize basically you have to wait for your flip flop and then you you get a chance to pounce um then after um, optional movement you resolve mines and the missile fire and then after that you resolve same hex combat um oh yeah and in that movement you would also move so say this orbital weapons platform might have if he was there now if he was there that's fine he would launch say he's on the second player turn so he's already moved he could launch an orbit launched rocket one two three but then this hunter killer might have done that one and then across two and then we resolve we've resolved so movements done then we resolve missile attacks so that orbital weapons platform will get a chance to fire missiles and then we do same hex combat and this is where the hunter killers come in with their strength of four against defense of two then we go to here we look at the differential differential plus two we roll two dice on an eight or better you will destroy and there's a very handy odds um, calculator there minimum is minus one five or better is the most so and you can team up so and you can do it however you like so i could have two hunter killers there against that if i there's no stacking limit um if i had two different units i could either team up two against one and leave the other or put one against each so you do it however you like to the your advantage um and uh that is basically it so um there's a few sort of specials you know like the special forces they can exit an orbital weapons platform or a shuttle but they only have so many turns before they have to get back or they are eliminated and i never got to a satellite but basically it's just a very big strong orbital weapons platform um but so that's great and the game is it's great the building situation is always interesting um you know you're trying to second guess your opponent you have to think about what they might have if you're going to build cheaply from earth but then you need some orbit um defense so that say so your enemy if he's got loads of units in orbit he might stick them all outside your cone so as soon as you launch a rocket from earth um, the hunter killer might pounce and try and shoot it down before it discharges its payload. So then you might ha you might ha have to think about a balance of or, um, launching from Earth, having it in orbit but at an expensive cost, and then having like a surprise um, reinforcement from some sector on or after turn four. So you do all that and then you play it and it does play fast. Um, you see it's very simple, um, movement simple, you've got no terrain effects, you've just got this orbital thing and combat is very simple and quick and clean. So um, it's fun and it's thrilling but um, these hexes are very small and you get lots of units in a hex and then you've got units moving next to them and you know especially close to the earth where you've got launches happening it all gets a bit congested and you don't want to nudge the earth counter because you want to make sure you're in the correct um, cone etc so um but i liked the game so much that i quickly um put up one of these and i also did something else when I did that, so we got bigger hexes, voila, okay, you know, so I can have a bit of a wobbly stack in one hex and it doesn't really affect the wobbly stack in the next hex. But I also did, you might quickly notice, I cut down on the amount of hexes. So here, normally every orbit has two, has a two hex, is a two hex band. But what that creates is it made it very difficult visually for me to kind of work out 
um, where units are going to be um, the next turn so you know where I'm going to place my forces relative to it so I did two things with that one was just made them all one hex band and the other was to color code it so visually you can see a lot more quicker so um, that meant that this which on the original map is only for some reason a one hex band it might just have been space limitations um, because of the nature of a magazine game um, so everything else, it, I just scaled it down. Now I played um, the third scenario, the tripwire like this, and I had a choice, do I, um, because I have the hex size, do I have the range of the missiles and the movements? And I decided no. And I played it like that and it played absolutely fine, not a problem. It's, it's, it's a bit of an artifact of the times, like the early 80s, I think this is, late 70s is, um, for some reason they could handle sort of more hexes and a bit more brain burn than, than we seem to be able to cope with today. Today we want it a lot cleaner, maybe slightly more abstract, it's, you know, especially like a fun game like this, uh, just easier to deal with. Um, and so this works out really well. Uh, and it, uh, If you print this out from Warehouse 23, I'd recommend printing this out double side. Or doing what I did and you know if I'd printed it I might I would have perhaps played with the colors so again to color code these bands just to make it visually more accessible they've done it in the sense of the lines but you can see this band has two different width of lines although it's actually the same band in terms of orbital movement so it looks nice um, this of course color and um, visual aid Color visual aid would have been even better. Um, very very nicely organized. You've got um game turn sequence here, you've got combat differentials for both sides. You also have the payload chart here, so that reminds you the shuttle orbital weapons platforms, earth and orbit launch rockets, supply counter, and the space station, what counters they can and can't, and how many of them they can carry. And then you have your um holding boxes for rockets launched from USA, rockets striking USA because you 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 will get a chance to shoot them down with missiles um, if you have any. Um, reinforcements on ground in USA and then USA deep space reinforcements. So there you go and uh, so like I say a gem of a game because it's um you have these exciting two phases the pre-game and the decision game um, which are both equally enjoyable. Um, you have the very interesting premise, nicely and simply um, uh, designed and simulated. Uh, but that just it, as a gem, it's a uh, not hugely valuable gem. I think it would have been a lot more valuable if it was produced today with something on, along the lines of this. Although you, you would want deep space blackness I think because that's part of the visual appeal too so there we go that is my overview of Wallace Wang's Orbit War from the Steve Jackson Games household